I'm Johnny Smith. I'm Richard Porter. And this is Smith & Sniff, a podcast in which two friends talk about cars and many other things. Well, listen, look, guys, um, got a conundrum here. I don't know how I feel about it. Autoglass. <laughs> you, 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 you might be... You might. I knew you were going to say that. No, you didn't. Um, no, I didn't. Yeah, so... We're all familiar with the company Autoglass, who do windscreens in the UK, right? Yes. Right. Yes. I was watching German TV the other day. Don't, <laughs> don't ask why. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Yeah. You've just come back from holiday in Menorca. Menorca, yeah. But I don't understand Spanish because I never learnt Spanish. And my kids think it's hilarious that I can only say like two words in Spanish. But I said, well, I just learnt German at school. So my son sifted through all the cable TV one evening when oh. we were bedding down. He said, oh, I found a load of German TV channels. Dad, you'll understand this. And he put it on. Now, the Balearic Islands are quite big with holidaymakers from Germany, aren't they? They're very big. Yes. Yeah. There were okay, two- so I understand that. There were two enormous non-stop smoking ladies uh, from Germany that were in the resort. They were the only two smoking people in the entire resort, and they were both serious <laughs> SIG loyalists and both wow. for sure German. Um, for sure. But anyway, the reason why I'm saying this is because there was a couple of adverts on this German TV, and one of them was for Autoglass. But guess what? They call that business in Germany. Ooh. Oh, auto. Auto is car in German, isn't it? So das Auto. Was. Yeah. The, or Auto is car in German. So let's just bear that in mind. What do you think? Glass. Glass. I can't. I mean, I did German for a year. I can't remember what glass would be. But so is it sort of Auto Glassen? Okay. Do you want me to say? Go on. It's car glass. <laughs> 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 and I, They've missed a sitter there, it's surely. Completely wrecked my head to the point where, after, I'd, I, admittedly, I'd had three pina coladas. I started shouting at the CV <laughs> with the kids and went, "What do you mean? What so?" In Germany, they call autoglass <laughs> car glass. What the fuck's going on here? This is stupid. This is ri- idiotic. Uh, and, did you cool. do? Did you do your favourite bloke from that nineties insurance advert? Stupid, just, just stupid. stupid. Honestly, that is stupid. So if I type in carglass.de... It should work. Oh, but the logo's the same and everything. Well, that's very disorientating. Well, it's also the the, the song, you know, um, Autoglass Repair, Autoglass Replace. They still have yes. that, but in German. And it doesn't say auto, it says car And glass. with the words changed. Yeah, I don't know what the other words are because they said it very quickly at the end and I was too busy shouting. <laughs> But um, <laughs> <laughs> seriously, I couldn't just, I was incensed by the lack of Germanic appeal here. So, That's uh, uh, well, why would mm. why, why don't they call it car glass here and auto glass there? This makes no sense Do at they all. Want to sort of deliberately be slightly confusing. I want a letter. I want a letter from someone from auto glass to Smith and Sniff explaining the rationale of all of this because it's too much for my small head to cope with, especially when I was on holiday. But, you know, Interesting. Look, I yeah. wonder if they workshopped this in Germany and went, and people went, Autoglass, no, I don't, I don't understand. Or what if you used an English word? For, uh, I, that's very confusing. Tell me about it. What distracted me slightly was there was some sort of... Uh, Formula One highlight reel that was going on that was obviously <laughs> German spoken. And I noticed, I don't know a lot about Formula One. I'll put my hand up and say that you know this. You know, Pierre Gasly. Yes. He looks just like the boy in Love Actually. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he is does, it, doesn't he? Liam Neeson's son. Yes. Uh, I can't remember the actor's name now. No, he's but he's he, an adult now, obviously, because that film was years ago. Yeah, but like he really does look like the Love Actually boy. He, You're right. He does have a look and of it's, the... It troubles me. The Love Actually boy. I paused it a few times, and again, I might have been a couple of pina coladas in, and I just went, that's ridiculous. Pierre His Gassi. name is Thomas Brody Sangster, is well, the actor. Right, well, they're the same people. Pierre Gasly and Thomas Brody Sangster are the same people. I'm convinced. Uh, 
Uh, he's what's going on here? Uh, he's uh, well, he's an adult now. We knew that. It's not like <laughs> stop it's saying good, like stop kept him <laughs> kept him bound up to retain his <laughs> childlike size. Stop uh, saying. Oh, of course, oh, he's an adult now. It was twenty hey. years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Where's this? I've just I've just searched him. It it looks like he's engaged to Tallulah Riley. Who's Tallulah Riley? Tallulah Riley, um, who has been married twice, I think, to Elon Musk. Oh, really? Oh, yes. hang on. Are you talking about Love Actually guy or Pierre Gasly? Yes. No, no, no. <laughs> Love Actually guy. Really? Thomas, whatever. He, oh, yeah. So Doyle sandwiches. So, so she's Elon's twice wife. Yes. Now it's an unusual idea. I'm not saying it's wrong because I don't know the ins and outs. But um, she, th- I think what's quite troubling is that she would have she would have seen Elon Musk naked and aroused. So, I think we oh should- God. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. We're going to have to burn the podcast down now. That's it. Yeah. The- but it can't. It still can't look as bad as a Cybertruck, can it? So I mean, it's okay. <laughs> <isn't> it? so- <laughs> um, I've just with, now. Hang on here yes because i got slightly distracted looking up boy from love actually because of pierre gasly however yeah autoglass as we know it is in fact you sure it's autoglass well it is for us let's we speak english it's so um a company the parent company is belron international limited they are british belron belron okay now they're headquartered in egham in surrey Ah, in case my dad. My that. dad went went back to university there as a mature student to 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 train as a teacher. Um, I remember going oh. to see him when I was a kid, and uh, he shared a room with a guy who had a beetle and a camper who threw the keys at me and just said, "Go out into the car park and do whatever you want with them." Yeah, that was really nice. <laughs> I mean, I didn't, I didn't like smash them up or anything or set them on fire. Uh, Belron is not is is although it's based in Britain, it is actually itself owned by a larger group from Belgium. Ah, that would explain the Belron, not Ron's a Bell or anything like that. No, uh, I'm going to mispronounce this because it's I assume it's a French name, Dieterin. Okay. Is the parent company now? This is again. This is one of these ones where if you went on Dragon's Den, they would accuse your business ambitions of being too diffuse because yeah. Dieteron own Belron, which is the auto glass umbrella company. Yeah, but they also own Moleskin, the posh notebook maker. Do they? I don't see any synergies. I don't see any, but I've I've used a number of moleskins. Um, I know they're lovely. Yeah, they're wonderful. But the reason I bring this up is because <clears throat> I've just noticed something that's quite that's <laughs> quite quite good. Um, so it's called Autoglass here in the Republic of Ireland and in Poland. Yes, it's called Car Glass in most of Europe. This makes no sense. It's called O'Brien Autoglass in Australia. O'Brien Autoglass. Yeah, I presume they must have bought an existing company. Uh, maybe an Australian listener can fill us in on that. Safe Light in the United States. It has two names in Canada, confusingly. It's called Libo or Speedy Glass. I, I wonder if Libo is the um, Quebec, Quebecois uh, name for it. <laughs> but then in this New Zealand. Like, yeah. Do you know what auto glass is called? Oh gosh, I don't know. Not not like I'm trying to think of what on earth it could possibly be. It's weirdly close to home. In New Zealand, auto glass is called Smith and Smith. What? Yeah. Smith <laughs> and Smith glass. Smith and Smith. Like this podcast, but the names got jammed. And it says glass at okay. the end? No, just Smith and Smith. Oh my gosh, Rich. I've just looked it up. Smith and Smith NZ is yeah, and they've got the same logo, that same little yellow and red logo. So do this they is... use the same tune with the different words? Can we... Smith and Smith replace, Smith and Smith replace. Can we get... Can we, can we do our own version with their permission? <laughs> I think that would be amazing. I can't believe that. I, I only started this conversation because I was just infuriated about the fact that the Germans call it car glass. And I was like, no, Well, I don't know can't. if I've made things better or worse for you, really, because... Well, it's a wormhole. Uh, it is a wormhole. Uh, no, see, I start. Uh, it's a very God, worthy. This is probably not an on-air thing to do, but I'm going to search for a Smith and Smith advert to see if it uses the same tune. We'll we'll, we'll come back to this because I won't breach. Yeah, copyright yeah. By well, doing it. in the meantime, um, my lovely colleague on the Late Break Show, 
and also who does a lot of stuff for us behind the scenes on Smith and Sniff, Lisa. She's mm. um, she's had a wet belt saga, and <laughs> this might make sense to people who have a Ford or a Peugeot, um, or I think it might be a Citroen vehicle as well. It's this. I don't know how else to say it other than just a bamboozlingly shit design idea mm. of putting a, a rubber cam belt into some oil. Yeah. And then, shock horror, the belt starts to degrade faster than <laughs> was realised. <laughs> because, because it's been constantly passed through a bath of oil, yeah. And, and, and in all the years of car engine designs, it's, I still don't get why we are making such major mistakes. It's, it's stupid, just stupid. And um, <laughs> well, it is though, is it? That 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 is a that is allowed to say stupid, just stupid, and it qualifies it. Um, so, so, what's happened to Lisa then? Well, Lisa needed a cam belt change service, you know, a major service, whatever you want to call it. She shopped around. She had a specialist do it, and they did it. And it just kept throwing up errors when she drove the car home, drove it back. They had it for another couple of days. They couldn't work out why, so they changed the oil again, and they found some more rubber fragments in the strainer, which apparently is mm -hmm. surprise, surprise. What happens? Uh, I was a bit surprised because I was like, "Well, tell this me." At least it's got um. She's got, Lisa's a, got a Peugeot. Yeah, she's got a 208. Mm. Um, Three-cylinder 208. And um, so I was like, well, that's just rubbish. They couldn't give her a courtesy car, so I lent her one of mine. And... Um, <laughs> it's like, it's like one of your courtesy cars. Like yes, you just keep a, a sort of a roaming freelance fleet of courtesy cars. There's the, yeah. Well, I've actually got my own courtesy car at the moment, but we'll come on to that. And um, oh, so she she had to send it back to the garage, and they apparently tried everything, and ju it just kept throwing these faults back up again. She was worried that the car was damaged, understandably. Mm. So in the end, she said, "I'm going to have to the the, the garage." said you're going to have to just give it to Peugeot and we'll you know we'll we'll pay some of the bill. And I was like what do you mm. mean some of the bill? I said you you paid a lot of money because it's an expensive job this wet belt camber challenge. A lot of mechanics and I'm sure some of them might be listening to this podcast. They're terrified of doing this job. It's it's a hateful right. job. You need a special tool blah blah blah. So they took it back, and it turns out that it had buggered some kind of solenoid or sensor, and of course it was throwing up a fault, and it was putting the car into limp home mode and all sorts of, of shenanigans. But it, I just don't understand why Ford, who make most of these wet belts, I think it's a Ford design engine, the EcoBoost-based thing, why have, they not why have they not changed it to chain? Because... A chain happily runs in oil and always has, and chains are better than rubber belts. I mean, I don't trust cam belts. I don't like them because I don't think something with such responsibility should be rubber, but that's just me. Um, a chain can go to hell and back, and it will still just hang on in there. Yeah, it'll get a bit slack, but it'll hang on in there. Chains don't really break. So... I want to know why we ever thought this wet belt idea was a thing. But the, as I kept saying it, when I was on holiday, trying to not think about anything to do with cars or work, <laughs> I, heard a, I heard a couple of Cockney people um, walking past. And I, and I thought, wet belt would be a really good Cockney insult. <laughs> because <laughs> it's because it's not quite insulting enough no because so, you just can't work out if it's genuinely rude or not but if they say no. it in such a way with such viciousness you go yeah but oh. they don't do they this is we've talked about this before because it always winds me up that sh shit cockney insults like melt you melt that's not an insult it's it's i it, that's bounced off me with ne'er a scratch because it's rubbish what? it's just it's it uh what about if I you came up belt. to you, picture the scene, we're in a bar, maybe the footy's <laughs> been on, my team's lost, <laughs> Yeah, you're from another crowd of people, but you, you, you barge into me trying to find the gents, and I turn round, I turn round and I look you up and down and go, oi, you, you fucking wet belt, look at you, you dirty little wet belt, get out of my face. 
<laughs> for a second, <laughs> for a second, you might <clears throat> be intimidated. Might. Yeah, no. Maybe. Okay. No. Okay. Uh, yeah. I, I, are they? Uh, is that the Ford EcoBoost three cylinder in that Peugeot? Or is, I thought that was Peugeot's own engine. They just happened to share a really shitty design characteristic. I, 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 th- I think you're right. I don't think it's the same engine design. I, but what I don't get is why it was decided that that it was a good idea that Ford did it. And, and don't get me wrong, when that EcoBoost one litre first came out, I remember testing it, mm. and it won International yeah. Engine of the Year. Um, yes. And, and among, amongst other accolades. And it was very impressive. But, of course, what we didn't know is the fact that um, it ended up being a silly engineering nightmare to, to live with, which is what we- I remember when that Ford engine came out, one of its boasts was, I think, for the one litre one at least, that the cylinder block was so compact you could fit it on a sheet of A4 paper. Yeah, I remember that too. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting to me, though, that I, I don't think they're related. I don't That's think they're Not officially, at least. No. But they do both have, they're both three cylinder engines with uh, that wet belt design. Yeah. And. Wet belt. So two large engineering teams from two large car companies came to the same conclusion yeah why i'm trying to think what advantage they would again i'm inviting large companies to send an apologetic letter to smith and smith because i think (laughs) i think it's due if you if you start searching up in on forums wet belt sagas there's a lot oh it's endemic isn't it yeah yeah, tra- I didn't. The- I actually didn't realise the Peugeot engine suffered the same thing because the Ford one. It's just sort of well known, isn't it? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, if you've got a wet belt f- um, Fiesta ST, it's worth a lot less than the non wet belt Fiesta ST. So I actually mm. think if you look at values, the old one, the last of the non wet belts, which sounds ridiculous, <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's always going to be the one that is more desirable, <laughs> and it just comes down to. A stupid engineering mistake. It's a greatly packaged yeah. engine, but why was it not? A, why was it not a timing chain? Anyway, well, we've said wet belt slightly too many times now. I think so. Can, <laughs> can, let's let's agree not to say that again. Uh, uh, we've had we've had a, a lot of messages that sort of relate back to stuff from previous episodes. I just wanted to do a quick canter through some of those. Uh, one from what, a Mitsubishi um, canter. A Mitsubishi canter. Yes, we still love those. <laughs> with, uh, love those. Slightly worrying what would happen in an accident. Um, <laughs> PE teacher's cars, uh, Simon from Leek in Staffordshire, as he signs himself, uh, says, on the subject of PE teachers and their cars, as a child of the sweet, sweet 60s, I attended a local middle school and it was there I first saw the gorgeous Miss Nelson, the girl's PE teacher. Oh, well. Clad in impossibly tight grey Alcantara trousers. (laughs) Alcantara? Alcantara. Did they? (laughs) Okay. Have they ever manufactured... Alcantara trousers? I don't know. I'm not sure about that. Anyway, and lacy white peasant top with obligatory partially unravelled drawstring. She was a sight to behold. She smoked more cigarettes and carried a worn leather pannier as a handbag. Her steed, a pearl white MGB GT with chrome wheels, rusting arches and black accents. A heady concoction of cigarettes and reeve gauche was an intoxicating antidote to the cheap soap and borrowed mum deodorant of my fellow female classmates. Can I just say that this? I'm st- I'm feeling just a little bit seedy because I'm sitting here waiting with bated breath at what you're going to say next because the picture <laughs> well, that's being painted is actually <laughs> quite quite very sexy. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, you're probably not going to like where it's going. In a way, I mean, the smoking—I um, could, could do without that. Simon continues. Our male PE teacher, Mister Washington, was a short, muscled individual with dark, flowing, brill-creamed locks and piercing blue eyes, a la Josh Brolin. Oh yeah, he gave off a mixture of horse liniment and brute. Wore a tailored black Adidas tracksuit and smoked Holland House via a pipe. His steed was a signal yellow Ford Capri 1.6 S with black vinyl roof and interior. We all wanted to be him and imagined various scenarios where he and Miss Nelson got it on in the sports equipment store at the back of the gymnasium. One early February morning in my final year, I remember seeing them arrive together in Miss Nelson's MG. I stopped briefly and from behind the art porter cabins witnessed a steamy in-car snog and some minor fumbling. 
It was still early and the car park was empty. No way! They both resigned shortly afterwards. And a few months later, I saw her in town, still driving the MG. As I approached the car, my stomach tightened and all my earlier trouser fantasies were consigned to the rubbish tip of life because on the back seat there were two, yes, two baby seats. Whoa. Mr. Washington, you old dog. <laughs> managed to... Um, managed to... Do you know uh, what it is? It's, it's the Capri effect. That's the Capri effect so? right there. I suspect so. Simon yeah. concludes by saying, later rumour had it that Mr. Washington totaled his yellow Capri after dropping his lit pipe while driving up the M6 to meet another lady. What? This is shocking school gossip here. Mr. Washington knocked up the female PE teacher and then crashed his Capri by dropping his pipe. <laughs> it's a remarkable tale. Um, it's not the only one, however. These stories get better and better. Uh, you know, I was talking, was it last? I can't remember which show it was when I was saying about how we sprayed a Vauxhall Sintra with slurry on yeah. old Top Gear. Yeah. A listener called Dave Law says, further to Richard's story of the smelly Sintra, <laughs> reminded me of my first few months. <laughs> There's a cockney insult for you, smelly Sintra. Um, <clears throat> further to Richard's story of the smelly Sintra, it reminded me of my first few months as an apprentice car salesman at a huge car supermarket in the West Midlands. We'd had a white Rover 214, brackets R8 shape, on the lot for months, priced to sell but with no one going beyond the test drive stage. I had no idea as to why until the day I got given the keys to fetch it round to the front of the showroom for a couple to have a drive in. I opened the driver's door and the smell hit me like a solid block. A mixture of septic tank drains and death itself. What? I actually dry heaved. Ooh. I then carefully got in, started it up, drove it round to the front of the showroom, where the expectant Mr and Mrs customer were waiting. I was new in the job. That's my excuse. To cut the story short, they immediately remarked on the smell, told me they weren't interested, then walked off, never to darken the door of our establishment again. In the office later, the sales manager smiled and told me the story of the White Rover. It had, so the story went, been owned by an elderly chap, as most white R8s were at the time, <laughs> and he wasn't in the best of health. I'm sorry, I can't dress this up in more fragrant tones. His colostomy bag had split on the driver's seat and footwell. Oh my! It had been valeted more times than any other car on the lot, but the noxious odour remained forever to be the left-handed screwdriver or spirit-level bubble for new salespeople. It eventually got sent to the auction block. But, I mean, I suppose it was a newish car back then, perhaps, but you would have just put a, a whole interior in it, wouldn't you, from another you'd car? you think so, wouldn't you? I mean, I, you'd buy oh, it and oh, put dear, a whole God. new preformed carpet set. But I mean, oh, I mean, seriously. Uh, well, anyway, it's well, revolting. Um, um, one final little stitch back to things, just because it, it amused me. That so we talked about uh, autocorrect car names mm -hmm. the other week. Yeah. Uh, Sam McLean says that his phone changes Kashkai to wash basins. <laughs> the Nissan what? wash basins. Nissan wash basins. Yeah. I I knew that this was going to be fun. I want this to carry on, especially into the darker what, months. Autocorrect. The the, yeah. <laughs> the car the car autocorrect game needs to continue. I feel uh, uh, we welcome it at all costs, please. But they have to be real at though, all costs. Fun. Crikey! Okay, right. Have you finished? I was just about to talk, change the subject. Do you want? Can I do that or go for it? Okay, I want to talk about coastal town tan men. Um, <laughs> saw saw an absolutely incredible example of the mark two days ago. I was I went for a <laughs> I went for a I went for a boat trip with the children where we did some excellent snorkeling um mm. and some of the foreigners on board did some excellent smoking which made me feel queasy and yep. um can't beat the smell of red diesel on a on a boat combined oh, yeah. with cheap foreign cigarettes honestly it, it really makes you feel great however <laughs> Coastal town tan men. Every every coastal town's got one, right? Um, we've talked about it, I think, a long time ago about the local tan man. But there was this amazingly, mm. amazingly leathery, dark medallion, actual medallion swinging from neck tan man. And I saw him strolling out of his little tender boat, almost jumped out of it while it was sort of like eight feet from the the harbour wall. Mm. tied it up 
um, had already cut the engine on the little Honda outboard, and he skipped yep. off, waved at a couple of women, of course, <laughs> and, of course. And, and then got into his car. What was his car on the, on the waterfront? Ooh. So this is a Menorca? This is a work... Yeah, so this is a working class guy, as in he's he's obviously got a fishing boat or a a pleasure boat. Yeah. He's not yeah. he's not like a, a media magnate or somebody that has a super yacht. No, he's doing water work mm-hmm. for a living, not not just as a hobby. Oh, he's he yeah, it's nautical and nautical maintenance, hundred percent. And he's leathery as an old boot because he spent all his days out in the sun for yeah. 30, 40 years. He's got a great smile and no top. On, and he's waving at ladies. Yep. Oh, <clears throat> in his day, God. Oh, oh incredible! Goodness. Talk of the town. Um, and this is this is Menor- this though? is Menorca. Remember, so yeah, yeah. You got to remember the sort of the, the, this is a country. I've got to say, this is a country where they don't really do flash cars so much. It's no, all about practicality and utility, isn't it? So I'm going to say, as my opening bid, early nineties, so late model faded to the point of almost being monochrome Renault 5 that's a very good choice it's it's not right that's the sort of thing I would have gone for and as he walked off to the car park as he got closer I I, I narrowed it down to two cars one was a first generation Ford Focus estate which had Mm -hmm. the, the cloudiest of headlights Obviously been parked in direct UV all of its 20-odd-year-old life. I'd have gone with that because there's plenty of room in the back for ropes and yeah. anchors and shit yeah. like that. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. And that had wheel trims, which I think you'd be very pleased with. Um, mm. But he didn't. He got into a Honda HRV. Do you remember the two-door late 90s? What? Really? Yeah. Was it late 90s, yeah. the two-door joy machine thing? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. He got into one of those, which had, again, wheel trims, not alloys, which I, I did marvel at. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. And, Interesting. Uh, yeah. It's like a burnt orange but, colour, almost the same as him. <laughs> Maybe that's why he bought it. <laughs> yeah. he went, this car's uh, never worn sun cream in its life either, so uh, I'll get it. I'll have like, it. I mean, I could see that, because I bet they're very reliable, aren't they? In, oh, I bet it's never had an oil change. Loads of room in the boot for life jackets and those wheels with big nobles on the outside and all that kind of stuff. So a good nautical, practical car. Well, I like... Uh, yeah. yeah. No, I can see that. I've never good. driven one. Well, I've never driven the little two-door HRV thing. I drove one back in the day because we tested it on old Top Gear. And I, I remember Honda sent a very early one over so we can have a go in it to be able to write a script i think vicky did a test of it on the show and it was actually quite nice was it yeah i seem to remember it was quite nice i i looked Not at amazing, it amazing just I looked at all it. right well i guess it's over 20 years old now probably 25 and i yeah yeah yeah. it was it was late 90s i think sugar because i looked at it and, and saw the the profile and thought that will modify quite well also no. quite a novelty back then because you know I don't, we're sort of very wearily used to crossovers and soft roaders or whatever else you want to call them but at the time there was sort of just the rav4 and i guess the freelander had just come along but yeah. the world wasn't <clears throat> full of cars like that so it was sort of a bit novel and it did look quite nice it was quite a neat design back from when honda seemed to have their shit together design wise yeah that's right uh, and let's not forget these were not big cars no first gen freelander not a big car not really rav4 no. definitely not a big car no. in fact the guy that's lent me um, a courtesy car uh, paul harding from super duper garage paul you're a man who has i think he has two first generation rav4s he loves a, an old rav4 which of your cars is in the shop well paul's been doing some uh, rejuvenation work on my Honda Element, which oh. I must say I I, um, I wanted to to do a load of little niggly jobs and give it a thorough um, service on the run up to kind of autumn and winter and stuff because it has been used quite hard. Turns out I had a crack in the gearbox, uh, which I had to get. Actually, I couldn't find a replacement gearbox casing. It's not the same as a CRV, tragically. So I had to get it. I had to get it welded. And I found an amazingly talented guy called Alex at the car kitchen who does weld repairs on engine blocks and gearboxes, all the stuff that most people are terrified of. And he did the best job, the best job, a true craftsman. Um, 
and I, I, so I need to excuse me I need to say a massive thank you to him and I got pointed in his direction by Adam at Fabco who's doing my Allegro uh, street sleeper build great to see people like that but so Paul's been been doing the work on the car but unfortunately um, things beyond his control he put the whole car back together again and the gearbox is working brilliantly um, apart from the fact that it won't go into reverse and it turns out that uh, it won't go into reverse because we think now there's a solenoid problem he sort of ran out mm. of time so he said look I'll lend you I'll lend you one of my cars he's lent me a first gen Nissan L Grand oh yeah what the heck yes I've been tooling around in L Grand that's what I went down to the air Poults on holiday in Recently. Really? Yeah. Is it? Is it, his courtesy car logic is wait. Johnny's got a very practical Japanese car you couldn't buy new in the UK, so I better give him a courtesy car that fits that description. I must say, Paul is a very attentive man, uh, mm. and he's very good at automotive matchmaking. And so ah. that's that's exactly what he did. Complete with electric curtains. I, I love the fact that a lot of JDM cars of that era had the electric curtains they draw themselves and they and then they draw themselves back on the touch of a button yeah. so cool lovely um so one little problem though and i do feel mm. guilty about this um put the window down on the passenger side and it never went back up uh, oh. i don't know if we've all been there before when that dread fills you of oh no it, mm. the, that window only goes one way Oh, and then shit. was it completely down into the door? It wasn't. It was down oh. halfway down. Okay. And then I parked it at one of those places where they park the car for you and then give you a ticket and say, tell us when you land and we'll uh, get the car out waiting for you thing. Yeah. Off of near Gatwick Airport. Unfortunately, mm. I, we're in a bit of a rush and I totally forgot to tell them that the window is down a bit, but don't worry about it because it's got JDM rain deflectors and it'll be fine. Um <clears throat> They sent me. They tried to phone me loads of times, but as soon as I was at the airport, I didn't answer my phone because I was in holiday mode. They sent me a text message saying, your window has unfortunately gone all the way down. We've put a bin liner over it. <laughs> oh. so, so I had to do the bin liner drive of shame for a while. Uh, but yeah, dr- <sighs> driving on the motorway with the window completely down for three and a half hours, let's just say that pisses off teenage daughters. Really <laughs> just teenage i would say that pisses off every most sentient human being no. doesn't it yeah but you know the, the 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 what restored it for me is 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 coming back from holiday with the window down luckily it was a hot day i took the bin liner off um i, I saw two not one two algal vehicles in quick succession oh. we, we get the odd um, email about this from uh, uh, and, and and messages on Instagram about people observing algal vehicles because there's a few about and they do make me chuckle. Yes, we had a very algal Astra near Gatwick Airport, which was yeah. which was white, <laughs> but it had it had been cleaned. I'm going to say okay, I'm going to say it had been cleaned with the stiffest of concrete yard brushes with oh. two mugs of water in thirty seconds. Mm-hmm. The whole car. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so they'd gone around really large areas, like the, the badge on the boot, which says Astra. They'd given it a, say, I don't know, a six-inch berth all the way round, which was just algal. So that wow. made me chuckle. But even better, this is one that took... As we were driving up the M, whatever it is, 23, the traffic going the other way was almost standstill. There'd been an accident of some sort, and I did the whole dad thing where I said to the kids, "Hey, bet you're glad you're not on that side of the road." And as we as we as we looked uh, along all of the traffic, do you know what I saw? The most algal of motorhomes. Oh, a really seriously algified motorhome. I'm going to say '90s era. Mm. Yeah. But I burst the hell out laughing when I noticed the fact that it was missing an entire door. So what? You know the main door to get in a motorhome. Yeah, it wasn't there. It just wasn't. <laughs> just wasn't. There. 
<laughs> it just did wasn't. you turn to your daughter and go, you think we've got problems? Yeah, honestly, honestly, it, it wasn't there. And I know those doors only open outwards. I know they do. Yes. Because you clip them back on themselves with a magnet or a latch or whatever. Yeah. So this person was going on holiday or coming back from holiday, having lost a door on their motor but I was trying to wonder what the hell <laughs> what, what scenario unraveled oh God. There? what was that about yeah I don't know maybe it was the same fate that befell your camping chair with a tail lift on a lorry somehow to <laughs> off. I don't know. you thought I was funny wow. didn't you that story that was a lovely uh, oh. intriguing backstory that you will never discover unless no. by some miracle that someone involved in that is listening how a motorhome could lose its door and then be found on the m23 well i think the important thing with algal vehicles is that there's one thing to see a very algal thing parked like yes. the the algal shogun pinning near your house <laughs> oh yes very algal but to see something algal driving along that's a whole different world yeah 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 because that's like it's it's mechanically able to move under its own steam, but you still don't give enough of a shit about the bodywork to sort it out. Oh, no shit's given. I I hope though, in my heart of hearts, that every algal vehicle that's being driven is 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 mechanically mint, absolutely yes. mint. So they almost yes. do it to toy to toy with us. <laughs> Like, like we said last week about changing the oil every week. They're those kind of people. It's almost like stealth mechanical perfection. Absolutely. I don't want anyone to know how beautifully my engine runs, even though it's got 170,000 miles on it. So yeah, I'm yeah, let yeah. the car go algal. They're the, they're the, they're the complete antichrist of the, the sort of detailing freak that never even checks whether their tyres are legal or, or the Antichrist? Oil. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay all right yeah um can we just do another little backcraft to was it last week you were talking about the truckers thank you the left right left right indicator oh yeah sequence yeah. yeah a couple of truck drivers have written in uh the first one is called george george says hello chaps young ish truck driver here hi After george. hearing johnny mention the left right left right thank you he received I'd like to reassure you both by letting you know it is still very much the chosen cheers mate, thanks mate, bye for most truckers. <laughs> we never use hazards as it's a sign of weakness, inexperience and incompetence. <laughs> is that true? <laughs> yeah, that's what he says. So, uh, here's my system for thanking other motorists for their kindness. If you've been nice, for example, allow me to join a slow-moving motorway, you're getting the left, right, left, right on the indicator stalk. So it's one if two you've been one two. Really nice. Yeah. Yeah, the one two one two. If you've been really nice, perhaps you've slowed right down to allow me to join a busy A road from a junction, you're getting the winky bits. Brackets flashing orange beacons. Oh wow. Finally, if you've been so incredibly kind and helpful by going out of your way to make my day easier, guess what? You're getting the whole fucking lot. I may even flash the rear fogs because it's Friday and the pub is waiting for me. <laughs> Cheers, George. George, you are an SSG. This is this well, is now, music to my ears. Uh, a little bit of extra information from another lorry driver. Alex says, I was listening to the latest podcast while motoring along the M4 and the subject of flicking one's indicators came up. Coincidentally, right as I performed the action myself after being flashed back into lane. Ah. Oh uncanny i thought i'd write in to say the art of indicator thanking is very much alive i drive a lorry for work and it's common courtesy to flick the indicators back and forth after another hgv or coach has flashed you in after overtaking to aid in knowing you're clear to move back over hgv indicator stalks are happily durable enough to be twacked up and down in order to perform this ritual i love that On indicator that thanking I know. I see. See, this is the thing. It's unearthed a whole world of politics, though. Yeah. On that side of things, Alex says, I myself tend to personalise my indicator dance in accordance with how lazy slash excited the vehicle behind was to flash me in. Okay. Such as a simple left and right for one high beam flash, all the way up to potentially six left and right flicks of the indicator if the driver behind is particularly flirtatious with his or her high beams. Oh, well. Alternatively, nothing at all if the driver cannot be bothered. 
Unfortunately, as I drive a Scania, my indicator flashes are always persistent in length as I cannot cancel the indication halfway through. If you drive a Volvo truck, you can flick the indicators left to right as violently as you desire <laughs> at non-consistent times, imitating a Stellantis concert. Oh, oh so you could do strobe indicating. <laughs> yeah, I guess maybe so the, the, the Scania still does its sort of lane change Interesting. thing. Yeah. yeah, so Scania are missing the trick here. That could be an optional extra. It feels like Volvo have sort of researched this more or spent more time with actual lorry drivers there's one more message on this from john um he's providing a little bit of context courtesy of his dad he said my father's had many jobs in his life as was often the way in the 60s and 60s. 70s one of these jobs was driving trucks delivering poultry all around the country for his sins he now travels the country collecting triumph tr7s and other old british tossery <laughs> oh gosh i can't work out what's worse collecting poultry or tr7s yeah. <laughs> both involve shit um <laughs> in this role i think he returns to his former mindset while towing a trailer he will go for the left right left right flick as we make progress through the lorries yes interestingly while driving the same vehicle without a trailer he uses the hazards as a means of conveying thanks right so maybe the flick is based in trucking and the hazards from normal driving see i feel like i do a, a hazards thing um in cars because uh yeah do you know what that's true when i'm driving a van i probably will go wild on the stock but when I'm in a car, I'll go for the hazard warning button because I, I mm. sort of don't want to damage the stalk. I feel like I don't want to... <laughs> <laughs> from using it too much. Overuse um, of the stalk. Yes. As, as a little uh, <clears throat> extra bit on John's message, he says uh, he works for JLR and uh, started his career working on the X250 estate. It's the um, the XF, the first XF estate, oh, which uh, nice. was... Um, called the sport break uh, he says his phone would often autocorrect it to shortcake <laughs> he would find himself texting other engineers and fleet managers asking if they had an xf shortcake he could borrow um, so, <laughs> mm, tasty i quite like that xf shortcake yeah, no, it's actually quite good, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, now, um, also, since we're doing some messages, uh, we were talking about unusual delivery vehicles that were actually prompted by um, a, a listener's question. And we've had loads of messages about this. Um, the, the listener called Tom says, some years ago I had a second job delivering pizza, which he took on to pay for the engine rebuild in his 1.8-litre 16-valve Volkswagen Corrado. Oh, really? Brackets in tornado red slash pink. Um, he says tornado well, pink. Succession, tornado pink exactly um, he, he said well the owner of this place has a succession of hatchbacks uh, there would sometimes be occasions when his car was out of action and for an extra ten for the fuel he'd sometimes have to use his newly fettled Corrado lowered of course I always lost money on those evenings and not just because of the bonus scrapes to the front splitter from the speed bumps in the streets of York um he then says he was reminded by a friend of back in the day, this guy's girlfriend, now wife, had an unusual pizza delivery car, which was this guy's Peugeot 306 Rally. What? Yeah, it's quite a good one, though, isn't That's it? That's a hell of a thing. Although they, were, they had a terrible lock on them, those cars. Do you remember? No, what, the, specifically the 306? Yeah, because the, because the Rally was the um gti6 but just with some sort of token oh. i thought slightly ridiculous weight saving measures that didn't really do anything but um was it homologated though like the one like the uh, 106 no it wasn't it was exactly the same car it just didn't have electric windows or aircon yeah. but yeah they had a six-speed box and the six-speed box was a bit longer than the normal five-speed in other 306s and it meant that the it, it they had to put um uh you know sort of a, a oh, wide in the, the track or something the rack. oh right right yeah right. And so the steering lock one way was worse than the other way. Was and it? I can't remember which way round it was, but it had a particularly terrible steering lock in one direction, yeah. And um, so, yeah, trying to do three-point turns and things like that was always a nightmare. So in that respect, not a brilliant pizza delivery car if you're doing a lot of, you know, zooming about to people's houses. Do you know, um, what, my, do you know what my perfect pizza delivery car would be? I, I, I thought about this after the last few letters weeks back yeah i'd like a i'd like a toyota iq one of the japanese import 
uh, they did a supercharged one. Was it called the GRMN or the Garmin? I always call it the Garmin. <laughs> well, it just looks like Garmin with a few letters removed. Yeah, uh, it does. Like the weekend, the singer, the weekend, it shortens the word weekend. Yes. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'd have one of those. Bloody love those. Mm. Love an IQ. And that has steering lock. Another anonymous listener says, all right, strokers, I live in a suburb of Leeds and the pizza shop, it's called Taking the Pizza, has a delivery driver who uses a Mark V Golf R32. What? He really is taking the pizza, says our listener, but I quietly respect it. He's that guy who his whole world revolves around that car. He's yeah, one of those guys. You're right. And I've got, you know, yeah. I've got plenty of time for those, those car people. Uh, that's, that's fair enough. Uh, Luke says, there's a Chinese takeaway across the road from my mum and dad's house that used to have an early Lexus LS400 as a delivery vehicle. What? Every panel had quite serious damage. <laughs> I mean, wow. I mean, the utter reliability, yes. But I mean, you're not going to yes. make any profit on the food stuff. No, Exactly. Well, some people have done a bit more cost breakdown. Uh, Luke does add that this takeaway is now smartened up and moved to a Nissan Note. Um, I want the Lexus Tom back. Gregory says uh, the majority of Domino's delivery vehicles in my area are Yaris's, i10s, Getz's, etc. But one chap does his deliveries in an Audi A4 Cabrio with the <laughs> magnetic illuminated Domino's sign perilously perched on the rear deck because, of course, he can't attach it to the canvas roof. Now, this question was originally triggered by a listener who had seen an Audi A5 Cabrio being used as a, a pizza delivery vehicle. Yeah. And I can't remember where that message has gone now. But um, so, in fact, another listener, James, said there's a guy around Wyway, Eastley in Hampshire, who delivers for Domino's in what looks like a quite well-kept Audi S5 Cabrio. Bloody can't hell. Sure the age is on a private plate. So maybe these are the same, it's the same people. This is amazing. It's still a uh, 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 charismatic car d- delivery, uh, pizza deliveries is still live and kicking, isn't it? It's not what yeah, I suspected um, it would be a bit of a 90s thing, but it's not. It is in Bristol. Not of pizza. Course. Yeah. Well, yes, of course. <laughs> God knows what they've got going on there. Uh, Josh says, I live in downtown Toronto. Get up quite early, so I always see the newspaper delivery driver doing his morning rounds. Yes, they still exist. This isn't a kid doing the run before school on his no-name rusty mountain bike. It's a man in his mid-50s driving a brand-new black Chevrolet Suburban. What? No, no. I've He's... never had a chance to talk to this man, but the running costs alone must meet, must eat up all of his profit margin. I just don't understand. I just simply don't understand. He needs a smart car. Yeah, you'd think so, wouldn't you? Yeah. Well, now, um, uh, <laughs> Dylan says, not current, but in Coatbridge near Glasgow back in the early 2000s, I recall a local takeaway delivery driver with a lifted pickup, something like an early 90s Hilux. It ran on huge monster truck style tyres, had a dustbin exhaust and sounded like a V8. The more I describe it, the more I'm having doubts. Maybe a local listener can corroborate or confirm it as pure imagination. Um, used it as a delivery. Was it liveried up? So it was a promotional tool as well? Or? I, don't, I don't know. It doesn't sound like it. Well, on that note, actually, uh, a listener called Neil, Neil Daniel, uh, says that um, talk of delivery vehicles reminds me of a few oddities we had around my way during the lockdowns of 2020 and 21. A few local business owners were obviously unable to work, so took up delivery work that had exploded with everybody stuck indoors. One guy was using his business's VW Transporter, complete with branding on the side for an events company that shall remain nameless. This van broke down one evening, and instead of giving it up, he decided to use his personal vehicle, a Range Rover Sport with the supercharged 4.2 litre V8. Oh, my word. For the next week or so, you could hear it charging around, making some lovely noises and always winning the traffic light Grand Prix against K11 Micros and Yarai. Yarai. He delivered to a neighbour while using this fuel-guzzling tank and was asked why he was doing it. He said there was too much competition for the work and if he stopped for a few days while the transporter was being fixed, he'd struggle to get back in the game. Do you know what That's I? Nuts. I I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, applaud all those people during mid darkest of lockdowns who had to di- to diversify careers in order to stay afloat. Well, I saw a few people delivering um, <clears throat> takeaway food, guys and women who didn't look like your typical takeaway delivery <coughs> person. I'm going to say that because 
One of them was driving around in an extremely well-specced E-Class Mercedes estate well, that, yeah. was, that was brand spanking. And, I, and he, he was a middle-aged guy that had a really beautifully pressed, quite expensive shirt on. So basically, mm. he looked like a yacht-owning dad. And he did. He turned up. <laughs> Yacht. Well, yeah, you know, but he turned up on the doorstep with two bags of, you know, uh, Tur- Turkish or Greek takeaway. And I kind of did a yeah. bit of a double take. So I thought, has he come to the wrong house? What's, what's gone on? Uh, but it turns out, I think, it, yeah, it was just diversity. It was also, it wasn't. I, I guess for some people, at least, it wasn't just about the money. In fact, it probably wasn't about the money. It was about something to do and being allowed out of the house. I think there's a sense of purpose. Just a tiny bit of human contact, even if it was from a distance, like leaving the, you know, leaving a bag on a doorstep. And yeah. At least you'd say, all right, as you ran off. Yeah. Um, no, Neil 100%. Uh, also says that around this time, other delivery oddities that he spotted included an Axiom quadricycle, oh, God. a fully liveried British school of motoring Persian, <laughs> <laughs> and a Volvo hearse covered in goth stick. No way. <laughs> Oh, wow, we've got yeah. it all. We've got it all, Rich. Um, it, it, it's not just happening here as well, because uh, Richard Gosling uh, writes, he says, this uh, chat about delivery vehicles took me back to 1991 when I was on a year out before starting university. Yeah. I arrived in Vancouver, and naturally the first thing I did was buy a car. I chose as my ideal vehicle a 1968 Ford Fairlane four-door in metallic grey. Oh, wow. With a 4.9-litre V8 engine working through a three-speed slush box. The second thing I did was find a part-time job delivering for Mondo Pizza. If I was lucky, the tips would just about cover the fuel. Really? At least I got my hourly pay and a lot of leftover pizza. One night I missed my breaking point coming up to a junction on a wet road and failed to stop before reaching the car waiting in front of me. My land yacht was unscathed, but the the same could not be said of the more modern tin box I'd slithered into. It was sorted out amicably, but by the time the pizza was delivered, it was late and cold and I didn't get a tip. I bought that car for 250 Canadian dollars, and after three months of adventures, sold it in Toronto for $590. Despite the fact the brake servo had failed a month previously, required Popeye-like leg strength to achieve even the slightest (laughs) slowing effect. (laughs) Also, by this time, every time the engine cooled down, it would seize and require a breaker bar on the crank pulley bolt to free it up before it could be started. Seriously? Wow. Even though I only owned it for three months, 33 years ago, I still miss that car. I, uh, it's so funny, isn't it, how these vehicles can make such an indelible mark. That's, I, um, I've never heard of that. An engine which would pretty much seize when cold. So you'd have know, to physically turn sound... it. That sounds horrendous. No, no. He needs to Horrible. soak the bores in diesel, at least. Uh, just a couple more of these. Uh, Ross uh, lives near... <laughs> It sounds like he lives, well, by his own description, near the Pulse and Cocktails on the A1 oh, near Rotherham. Nice. Um, <laughs> he says there's a fellow around here delivering either U- Uber Eats or parcels in a bright yellow proton jumbuck with white banded steel wheels on it. That sounds cool. And there's cool. another bloke. Well, yes, I suppose. It's Dangerous. definitely a look, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, there's another bloke near me who has a landscape gardening company and tows his trailer with a Hummer H2. All I can think of is, well, you're not making much of any job using that four mile per gallon box of woe, says Ross. That's not a bad way to describe it. They are gash. Um, yeah. Well, um, well, now we have had, because I'll wrap this up by saying there's a couple of people who've written in and actually given us a bit of insight into the world of delivering. Um, oh, okay. One of them is a listener called Sammy, uh, who says, as well as a being a full time telecoms engineer, I supplement my wage after my wife convinced me to buy a house we can't really afford by delivering the sweet, sweet goods. And he's included a picture uh, of a branded hat from a well-known pizza chain. There are many stories I can tell of drunk, naked, high and strange people. But today's not for that. It's about the cars. Naked? My, my <laughs> name. <laughs> <laughs> naked pizza. I mean, perfectly normal. Okay. Okay. Uh, Sammy says, in my particular branch, we have a range of motors, Nissan Micro K12, Honda Civic, and a very ropey Leaf, to name a few. 
but there are no rules on what we can drive as long as it's legal. We get paid an hourly rate and also per delivery. So yes, cars can earn you money and some you even break even on. My choice of cars has always been a bit eyebrow raising from a Panda 100 horsepower, a BMW E91 320D and my current choice, which is an Alfa Romeo 147 1.6 twin spark, slightly modified with Coney suspension, poly bushing and PS5 tires. But that sounds great. it gets 32 to 34 miles per gallon. In an average evening, I do around 10 to 15 deliveries. So yeah, I guess the math sort of works on that, I presume, because otherwise uh, it wouldn't. Um, and then finally, no, another wouldn't. delivery driver, or, or rather ex-delivery driver, Adam, uh, he did uh, Domino's driving in 2020 during the lockdowns, what I now look back on as a golden age. Fuel was still cheap. Was it cheap then? I don't remember. I thought it was expensive. Nah. But um, Adam had a 1.1 litre Fiat Panda that he shared with his mum. But Domino's would pay for our fuel as long as we collected all our receipts and remembered to hand them in by Sunday. Then it would be added to our paycheck. We also got one pound extra for every delivery and eight pound fifty an hour for an eighteen year old in a small town where every job is minimum wage. I felt I was bawling. So bawling. But he, he was doing it in his mum's one point one litre Fiat Panda, but he said his manager had a Fiesta ST and it was not a wet belt delivery. <laughs> one of the other delivery people, no, this is Adam's words, that one of the others was, according to Adam, an immense bullshitter <laughs> who had a Seat Cupra R Mark 1, 1.8 turbo, that was apparently around 300 horsepower. But this guy also said he could do the entire wash up <laughs> the branch of Domino's in 10 minutes. <laughs> 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 Presumably, that's why he's described as an immense bullshit. I love the term immense bullshitter, but I, yeah. Well, he, we've all known a few immense bullshitters in our time, haven't we? We I have. Think. Did he say it was yeah. a first generation um, Ibiza Cupra R? Uh, it doesn't actually say if it's an Ibiza. For some reason, in my head, I filled in Lay on there, but yeah. I don't know. It just says Seat Cupra R, so because don't know. Early Cupra Rs were very special. Yeah, they were quite. Yeah, because yes, they were just a bit well, spicier than an equivalent Skoda or VW, weren't they? They were, and the VWs were always had the spotlight thrust on them. But since VW have got worse, I think Seat. You realise that Seat, but the same way that Skoda's cooler than Volkswagen these days, in a way. Um, well, not in a way. I think actually cooler. <laughs> what? Actually. Actually. <laughs> actually. Yes, I, yeah. I, 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 Hello, I think so. I'm actually. Um, look, I, I, there's been a few observations that I've made while I've been holidaying, but I wanted to – this one, I felt like I had to share it on the cast with, with mm. you and the listeners. So, first of all, this is an open apology to Toyota – the Prius. I was in two Prius taxis over the course mm. of the last week. They were both yeah. Prius Pluses, which are the estates. Is that right? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And I think second generation, late mm, second. Um, when the Prius came out and started to become really popular, lots of people hated on it. And I think I might have yeah. even given it a kidney punch here and there. But the world has got so much worse, the motoring world, since the Prius, that second generation, came out, that actually I feel like it's a really good car <laughs> at what it does. And it doesn't boast, it just bloody gets on with it. And the ride and the layout of the dash and everything and the little kind of weirdly marital aid looking gear shifter, it's, <laughs> I actually had so much time for it. And I thought, oh, this car, an apology, because I think they were an easy target and actually... In a, in a sea of absolute cack that's on sale mm. right now, that kind of Prius is actually a really good fit-for-purpose car. But the second Prius that I was in pulled up to the taxi rank. A uh, lady driver got out. She couldn't speak English. I couldn't speak Spanish, as I've mentioned. So the car I got in, the lady pretty much said, hang on here, I, I really need a coffee. She ran, in, mm -hmm. ran into a cafe, got a very short espresso, ran mm. back with it, pretty much downed it in front of me, and then set the trip and asked where we wanted to go. So the car was immaculate. My window was down, passenger window, and hers was up. And then she turned to me 
and she said something in Spanish and then I didn't understand and she saw that I didn't understand. So she then voiced it into her phone and did a like a translate on the screen. And uh, do you know what do you yeah, know what yeah. the screen said? This God. this was so good. Okay. She said it and then turned the screen of the phone to me and it said Um I personally prefer to drive with the windows down rather than the air conditioning on. Is that okay with you? <laughs> <laughs> did you did you kiss her honestly i i i almost gave her what would have been traditionally termed as a full kiss i was so overjoyed i giggled and i said to the kids you guys are happy with the windows down and they went yeah and i went yeah i love the windows down and i, I think she was surprised how enthusiastic i was at her, her <laughs> suggestion but um, I just thought it really made me laugh after all the AC uh, avoidance that I seemed to take part in. It was just perfect timing. So I really, really enjoyed that. Um, the taxi was also called, cool. it was also number five. You know, I guess it's a, a taxi company and they number their cabs and it was taxi number five. So I started singing Mambo number five for the rest of the day, which really pissed my children off. <laughs> And I realise that, that that song, which is what, late 90s now, Mambo Number no. 5? Mm. It just basically lists women's names, doesn't it, really? Yes. And yes. it's not that cool, is it, frankly? <laughs> so, <laughs> no. so uh, yeah, in my full dad spec, I have to say, thanks to the Google Translate um, saga, really enjoyed my Prius non-air conditioning journey. And I enjoyed a lot less the coach transfer from the hotel to the airport, largely because when I got on there, Radio Gaga was playing, <laughs> uh, which is probably one of Queen's worst songs. And then... Do you think? Yeah, it's annoying. And it's I, oh. I only ever hear it on German radio normally. Um, <laughs> I think the Germans love Radio Gaga. Um, and then... Worse still, the song Tub Thumping came on at, let's say, seven in the morning. I don't want to hear Tub oh, Thumping at seven in the morning. No, in fact, no, wrong time. don't want to hear it at 7 p.m. either. <laughs> but I get knocked down, but then I get up again. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Who cares? Um, yeah, so those those things were a bit, bit crap. But underlined by inane chat from other passengers, other holiday makers who were trying to get to know one another, but kept saying the same no. things. And it was very irritating for me, who just wanted to sleep for a while. <laughs> like, yeah, I've heard, I've heard there's some bad weather coming in tomorrow morning. And then there was a pause. And then the other person who was listening went, yeah, yeah, I've heard about some bad weather coming in tomorrow morning. And it's like, yeah, you just said that. <laughs> That's what was just said. <laughs> So, so. Good. well, um, <laughs> no, I'm not that angry. I promise, I'm not that angry. Okay, sounds like your holiday was very relaxed. Yeah, it was great. Uh, we it was we great. should um, we should wrap this up. Yeah, uh, but for now. But uh, before we do, um, three things that I should tell you. Firstly, uh, Johnny's embarked on a project to remake a 1970s luxury car for disgraced entertainers, but in association with our favourite female singer under the working title, the Rolls-Royce Silver Sade. If that's not to your taste, then go and look at the Late Break Show on YouTube. Excellent channel full of uh, videos about cars and people who love them. What's up there at the moment? We've got a heavy hitter of a one-owner folds so a very very last of the line rare forwards um oh. barn find and if you're uh -huh. lucky a day or two later you'll probably get part three of my patinated citroen 2cv project rejuvenation uh, part three's in the edit right now uh, it should be ready to go by then so thanks um good <clears throat> And I was going to say one more thing, and I can't remember what it was because you put me off by asking me the question. Hang on. Let me just check. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not trying to catch you out. <laughs> no, it it's wasn't. Not, there. It's not, it's not oh, I know what it is. I know what it is. Um, yeah. Led Zeppelin. Uh, I mean, Led's being phased out because, you know, bit toxic and is, it, is this relevant to the end of the show? Yes. Or are you just off yeah, on some yeah. flight of fantasy? No, again? I just thought they need to. They need to modernise. I think they should call themselves LED 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 Zeppelin. 
Okay. Well, you laughed. Yes. You laughed. I did. Yeah, well, Zeppelins you... aren't very modern either. They could they should call themselves <laughs> LED drones, shouldn't you know they? They sound like something else I entirely actually, different. I'd actually completely forgotten that Zeppelins were a stupidly old invention. I just thought about lead. <laughs> I'm, I'm the thick um, shit here. I'm so thick. Anyway. Uh, the second so. thing to tell you is that uh, if you're listening to this uh, on the Monday or indeed the week that it comes out, this Friday, uh, the 13th of September, is when the very last Grand Tour adventure with Clarkson, Hammond and May will go live on Amazon Prime Video. Uh, so I just thought I'd give it a mention because I think it's quite good. Not to be too boastful. I mean, I didn't do a huge amount for it, really. I just sort of do car stuff and a bit of the kind of figuring out where they're going to go and what they're going to do. And it was generally agreed with this that it should be a bit sort of stripped back and a bit like, let's not just try and do too many gimmicks and things like that. Just the presenters got three cars they really, really wanted to get. No more excuse than that. And went to a place they really wanted to go to and then just did a road trip. And I think it's the ending that we always hoped we could do for the Clarkson Hammond May era of Top Gear and the Grand Tour just brings it all in with a, hopefully a bit of dignity. It's quite emotional. I shed a tear when I watched it for the first time. Did you really? I hope it affects people. Yeah, I did. I found it quite affecting. Um, it's just look on Hammond's face at one point. You just go, he doesn't want this to end. There's genuine sort of wistfulness there. And I think they're all a little bit like that. You know, they are mm. old and tired and they can't really carry on. But. It's been a heck of a ride for 22 years, so it is always going to be sad when we kind of go, that's it now. So, yeah, it's out It's out on Friday. I hope people like it. I am really, really proud of it. It's a proper end of an era. I know people say that lightly these days. And um, been a, it's been a big ride for you guys. And I remember when it you, really has. You, it's, you chatted to me about it in private, about how powerful it was. You didn't realise how emotional this, this kind of culmination and finale would be but i guess it is a big deal no it's a really big deal it's it's weird because we did that and i was supposed to go on the shoot because we want to have a big party at the end of it and then for various reasons i couldn't go and there wasn't a party anyway so we had one i mean we had a we had a sort of end of days party for christmas and that feels like ages ago and then we had to film a load of other stuff this year for something and we've got a a launch event tomorrow night for media and some competition winners and stuff like that so i'm going to be hanging around with those silly twats again tomorrow so in a way it's sort of like we it's not like we never see each other but on friday when this goes out i guess for viewers who've enjoyed watching new adventures this will be the last one so it does have a sort of full stop quality to it but um yeah i just hope people like it really because because i think it works um and the third thing i've got to tell you is oh actually do you know what no fuck it i should promote my book because my book should. about working on top gear and on that bombshell uh there, there's there's a bit of retrospective stuff going on around clarkson hammond and may and their time working together if you want to read about the top gear years i wrote a book about it and on that bombshell available all good bookshops and off the internet and stuff and the third thing uh, I've got to tell you, is uh, there's been a lot of talk about Oasis the past couple of weeks for mm. obvious reasons. You know, their logo was originally meant to look like the Adidas logo. They tried to use the same typeface. And at the last minute, it was realised that using that typeface, it made their name look like it said Oosis. <laughs> So the designer came up with a different typeface instead, which is the logo that we all know and which they still use today. Oosis. Usis, yeah. <laughs> oh, Usis have reformed with Newell Gallagher. <laughs> I presume the, the Usis reunion means the end of Noel Gallagher's high ratio gearbox. Oh, but, um, of course. Maybe he'll go back to that. I don't know. Oh, he, he absolutely. Uh, anyway. Right. Well, look, thank you for listening. We'll be back on Friday with another and the BDAs. Otter and back next. Uh, when Lee, <laughs> when Liam's BDAs. on tour, he's going to just rebuild a couple of BDA, real tune them to shit, just oh, have them God. in his. They don't list. like being left, though, do they, the BDAs? I hope he's got someone coming in to just turn it over every so often. Oh, he will. Oh, it's, it's not good for it. Okay. Well, uh, thank you for listening. We'll do this all again next Monday. We'll have an Otter Sot on Friday before that. Uh, until then, goodbye. Bye. <laughs> enjoyed this podcast but you've had a thought is there a way here today that you could show support 
Well, you could join our Patreon, what wonders that it brings. Early shows and extra notes on that side of things. You could buy our merchandise with mugs and hats, but still no ties. One day we will make those pies, but in the meantime, guys, hey guys, like and subscribe, and maybe leave a nice review. Like and subscribe, we know you know just what to do. Like and subscribe, we don't want to take the piss. Like and subscribe, but we were told to ask for this. Like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. The, the sound of a squirrel when it's when it's sort of chattering its teeth and and it's and it it kicks its tail out like it's being mine like it's been licking a nine volt battery. I find that quite troubling. I don't like that. I mean, I think they're built for it. Do you? Are you worried what the the squirrel? <laughs> I don't. You worried, you worried the squirrel's going to break? I think put too much shock through the chassis, and eventually. <laughs> Eventually, <laughs> it's within I the spec. Be You're okay. Is it? Is it though? Do we know that? Yes.